Hello, true creatives, and welcome to another episode of the Idea to Value podcast. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn, and I'm thrilled to have with me today, Ralph Christian Orr. He is a thought leader and corporate innovation advisor, specializing on helping companies scale up their innovation uh, and also bring in place the ambidexterity that's required to both uh, improve the core of the business as well as explore future opportunities. Ralph, it's good speaking with you again. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nick, and it's good to be uh, on your show again. Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Having me, Nick, and then it's good to be uh, on your show again. So, for people who missed you the first time, could you just give us a very brief background as to where you got started and how you got to where you are now? Yeah, actually, I was uh, for, for many years a corporate guy working in, in corporate development, corporate innovation uh, across uh, different industries such as energy, um, semiconductor, um, 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 and sensors, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera, and. Um, uh, in each company, I, I was facing more or less the same issue when, when it comes to innovation. And, and that brought me actually to the concept of ambidexterity, meaning uh, so how can companies achieve it to develop, sustain their existing business, but also uh, in parallel come up with new business streams and, and, and new opportunities. And this is a pretty old academic concept, ambidexterity, as, as you may know as well, uh, Nick. And uh, I, I opened my blog in 2000, back in 2013, and, and tried to write about that, uh, yeah, just to, let's say, digest it for myself. And then I got a, a lot of resonance from other companies, and they, they told me, yeah, well, this is, this is awesome, exactly what we are facing. So could we, could we collaborate? Can we, can we talk? And well, at some point back in 2017, I decided to stand on my own and, uh, let's say, become an advisor on what I call dual innovation, which is an advanced, uh, form of ambidexterity, I guess we will come to that in a minute or so, um, and, and uh, yeah, decided to really educate uh, companies on that and try to, to implement uh, the, the concept because I think it's, it's really um, future proven for companies. So they need it. It's not a, not a nice to have anymore as, uh, as Steve Blank mentioned recently, it's, it's a must have. Absolutely. I mean, we've talked about ambidexterity on the podcast before. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with it, it's this idea of having a company that can both run their current business, uh, what we call exploiting the, the current uh, offerings, but also developing new offerings for the future. So exploring the future. Um, and what a lot of companies seem to struggle with is uh, the fact that if you try and do both of those things at the same time, with the same people and with the same management frameworks, then very quickly things seem to fall apart. So Ralph, well, Ralph, what's been your experience actually seeing how companies try to start being ambidextrous and, and what usually seems to be so challenging about it? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. I think, um, um, first of all, um, when it comes to ambidexterity, that people need to learn to think and also operate in two distinct tracks, right? Um, so, and uh, so the, the explore track and the exploit track. And they are, let's say, from the requirements, from the environment, uh, completely disparate. And so very difficult to reconcile under one uh, corporate roof or however you would uh, uh, call it. And what most companies do is they try to establish some kind of unit accelerator or, or a lab and they you know they start some activities there um, quite distant from the core business so because separating those activities works for many companies uh, in particular in the in the technology sector in the industrial sector um, not so well in the service sector as, as re research proves um, so but for most companies it works so they start those activities and um, but at some point, they they realize, oh well, uh, it's not just about separating stuff. We need to 
um, along scaling things up in the later stage, which requires an, an embedding into the core business, which which requires drawing on the on the assets and capabilities on the core business, um, which requires a, a, let's say an integration to a, to a large extent with the core business. So they they often miss out there, and they have not designed this phase into the corporate innovation process uh, right from the beginning. And that's why they are struggling, at least in in, in my view. And we, this, we, we put this out as a hypothesis back in 2017. We call it uh, scaling up problem. And uh, many companies like Bosch and uh, BP and um, Telefonica and others approached uh, us and, and said, okay, that's exactly the point. So we, we need to come up with a with an approach who allows integrating both camps in, a, in an effective way, in a, in a specific way for the, the companies. And um, that what led at that time to, to our book, Scaling Up Corporate Startups, where we tried to put together some principles, how you could go about that, 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 that issue. And um, then after that, uh, BP really told us, okay, uh, well, it, this, these are great findings, so let's put them into practice. and. Uh, these are actually the, the basis for their their uh, current uh, scaling up factory, as they call it, Launchpad. You may have heard of that, which is supposed to exactly bridge the exploratory activities, R&D, um, you know, venture capital, etc., with the with the uh, uh, traditional businesses. So it's a really um, venture builder or or, or a scaling up factory, which has been designed dedicatedly to, to, to build a bridge between the, the different management systems or environment. And I think this is the critical part. Yeah. I, I wrote an article a while back, uh, which talked about how innovation dies at the handovers. And uh, going all the way back to where this concept of how you fix the, the requirement for ambidexterity, um, often attributed to Clayton Christensen saying, to solve the innovator's dilemma, you need to have a dedicated innovation unit, which is separate from the core business. Theoretically, it makes perfect sense. But the issue, as you just pointed out, is when you have developed something in one part of the business, and then you need to hand that over to the current business to actually start making money from it. Um, the fact that these two business units have not only um, developed things separately up until then, but also maybe have other incentives uh, that people get uh, sort of judged on, how performance is measured, how uh, how project development and project management happens in these two entities is so different. That's one of the reasons why so many innovation projects fail at these handover phases. So if, if, if that's not the solution, uh, then what is uh, this scaling up approach, this uh, dual innovation approach that you were talking about originally? Yeah, maybe um, I would like to touch on on another point, which which I think is is quite important to point out. When we when we speak about Christensen, I think it, it's often confused as a as a as a response to disruption, but we we often also talk just uh, about coming up with let's say innovation that are not compatible with the core. These are basically two different things. So a, a non-compatible innovation that doesn't fit uh, into the current core business at, at, at a point in time does not necessarily mean it has to be disruptive, right? So um, I think you have to be careful with that. And um, so the, the Christian approach was one particular approach to respond to, to mark disruption, but there are, there are also several others which might be convenient for companies um, in, in in different circumstances. Yeah? So really, it's, it it depends on on which uh, uh, on which settings it is the, the companies are in. So this this is this is the, I think the first point. And um, this integration part. I mean, um, Steve Blank also recently mentioned in a in a forward to to lead and disrupt the, the book from Tushman O'Reilly, uh, which which let's say was issued in a second edition, he clearly said, "Scaling is the crux of ambidexterity." So quote, and uh, so if if Steve Blank uh, <laughs> points this out, it, it has some some kind of power, right? And uh, I think uh, 
this this has has been widely disregarded so far. So um, and what what companies usually face is that they they they, they, deliver, they develop ventures up to a certain point in validation and then try to fit it into the into the core business, but the ventures are still too immature to uh, be embedded in the core business yeah? because they underperform uh, with respect to the business metrics. They, they, they usually start to uh, demand exponentially increasing resources, which lead to political discussions. They have a potential to disrupt the, the core business if, if, they, if those are, let's say, uh, at least internally disrupting uh, uh, innovations. And, and there are a lot of reasons why it's difficult to bring them together or what, to, to integrate them. And I think um, you have to plan this right from the beginning as a, as a dedicated phase or a, a dedicated part of the corporate innovation approach. And this is exactly how dual innovation differs from, a, a, let's say, a, the traditional notion of ambidexterity as it is widely used. So ambidexterity usually, let's say, um, addresses two tracks, yeah, the explorer and the exploit track. And the dual innovation is basically you have some purely exploitative activities around the core business. You have some purely exploratory activities. Uh, identifying opportunities, working with startups, um, uh, idea management, validating innovations. But there is some, you know, in between some, some, we call it white space that has been widely disregarded so far that really aims to connect it. And uh, I think there are different, let's say, brackets to do this. Um, you can, could l- roughly um, um, differentiate three of them. One on the leadership level. So really, um, an exploratory leader uh, owning exploratory activities needs to to be in alignment with their, their business counterpart on a, on a high level to make sure um, new ventures get the support they need, get the auto- autonomy they need in a corporate setting and, and so on and so forth. The second is uh, maybe on an organizational level. So the, the organization and entities need to be aligned with respect to strategy so how do they act in a complementary way how can it how can for example an innovation lab complement with with its activities the current core business so that it produces valuable innovations later on that that uh, uh, are are make sense to be integrated in the core business and often they act in a kind of vacuum and then later uh, they try to push those ideas into the businesses and they, they say, oh, well, I, I, I don't need it. So this is far away from, from what we are doing, right? So it's not strategically aligned and then they fizzle out or, or are being killed or, or whatever. And the, the third uh, layer, I would say, is on a personal level. So if you really have the day-to-day business, you need to make sure that uh, the people from the two camps, the core business, corporate functions, but also from, from the venture or from some supporting exploratory unit um, have a have a good basis to collaborate. They, they are let's say jointly incentivized um, with the with the venture. They have let's say aligned priorities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I would say if you cover these three um, layers, um, of course it's it's still highly abstract. Uh, you would need to let's say dig into the details now. But if you if you consider these three layers, I, I think you have a have a good chance to make this connection happen uh, inside the corporate. I think definitely. And uh, it's it's interesting that where previously, as you've said, uh, people have been talking about two camps. And because there's only two of them, they are separate. And they're separated by this white space. People forget that ideas and resources need to travel through this white space. Um, and what I've also seen uh, when when working with companies and doing the research is there's different skill sets and mindsets uh, across the entire organization, usually, between people who are very comfortable with the front end of innovation, especially ideas that are very different from the core business, uh, and people who are uh, good at running the core and uh, and, and running uh, new projects. And there's quite often very few people who are good at a bit of both, the sort of people who would act as this transition from a team that is, let's say, had a great idea, validated it, 
developed a prototype, developed a, a beta version, maybe even got their first paying customers. But then that's the limit of their skills. They, they're they not necessarily the sort of people who are good at developing scaling approaches or uh, mass manufacturing um uh business development uh customer success uh customer support all these things that would be required to take it to the next level so when you're talking when you're talking about scaling up uh and this dual innovation approach i i'm sure there's multiple options but what are some of the things that are going to be required in this middle space uh to actually connect these two quite separate camps Usually, what what many many companies do, and and what also, for example, uh, BP British Petrol uh, was doing, is they come they they have established a dedicated unit that really let's say takes care of this this uh, uh, this space in between. Because most often those let's call them scaling up ventures, uh, if 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 they um, if they make it. Uh, up to that point, we have to say um, they 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 navigate in a kind of no man's land yeah, between two different organizational entities. So and nobody is basically responsible to it. And then uh, they they run out of funding, they run out of support, they run out of um, uh, um, um, assets that they could leverage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it, I think a good good. Um, First step is to cover cover this this white space with a dedicated uh, let's call it space or entity, however that look like. Many companies build up venture builders or what they call scaling up factories. Uh, Scania has taken a, a different approach, which is also quite interesting. They have kind of like a let's say platform approach, I would call it, with a with a rather small team that that uh, is supposed to act like an orchestrator in the middle and just uh, orchestrating and coordinating the the, 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 the cooperations and the R&D or the exploratory activities and make sure that this connection happens and that, you know, the, the ventures uh, are, are not fizzling out. Uh, and so with, with everything that, that belongs to that. And uh, so I think a good first approach would be create ownership uh, in some in some respect. Uh, to, uh, to cover this this space, otherwise nobody takes ownership, and then the, the ventures are are getting lost after some point. Absolutely, there's so many examples of again. It comes back to these handovers when one team feels like their part of the job is done and they give it to someone else. I've seen so many instances where companies don't have an efficient innovation pipeline or an innovation portfolio to actually see what are people working on and what is listed in our list of projects that maybe no one's working on. So you end up with this list of zombie ideas or vampire ideas that are still taking up resources, but no one feels responsible to actually deliver them. Uh, <laughs> and that that uh, often is also one of the reasons why uh, leaders quickly lose faith in these innovation entities that are supposed to deliver and end up not delivering because the people there think, oh, I'm just here to come up with the ideas and maybe do some uh, some some prototypes, but I'm not actually here to deliver. Exactly. Uh, I, I remind of a, of a quote from from uh, um, one guy from PP we were working with when, when setting up the, the, the venture builder, and he said, you know, we are basically ambidextrous, so we have those camps, but we don't have the the brain. To interlink them, and this this made me thinking because that's ex exactly nails the point, right? Uh, usually, companies or many companies, not all, they have two different activities, right? And uh, I think they are meanwhile very good at that. But when it comes to let's say link them together across different um, dimensions and, and, and uh, required elements. They, they still fall short. And this is exactly this, this brain or where, you are, where, where somebody has to, let's say, stand with one feet in, in each, you know, a camp and needs to make sure the linkage uh, gets established, right? Now, we've talked about, I think everyone would agree, we've talked about how uh, this concept of amnesty austerity is vitally important for any company that wants to 
continue exploiting their current business, but also growing into the future and protecting themselves a little bit from from the potential of disruption. Uh, I think your concept of dual innovation obviously makes a lot of sense. So the the why is very clear. But let's talk about the how now. And I think it's always interesting talking with uh, with innovation experts when it comes to the question of how. Because at the end of the day, what it usually comes down to is it's a bit different for different companies with different needs. So there's probably not one perfect design of how a company does dual innovation. Um, so let's let's you and me talk about a couple of different options. Let's uh, what sort of different ways of actually performing dual innovation uh, have you come across that you think are effective in one particular scenario, and then we can go into other scenarios and in the next bit i think first of all i have to say um i'm not a big fan of let's call them frameworks or or let's say um blueprints or something that that are let's say uh, aimed to, to to work for every company in the same way i think rather um it's good to base the approach on certain let's call them basic principles or or basic success factors and that uh, for this this connection between explore and explore and or, or scaling up there are a lot of success success, success factors and um, well, I can cannot name them here in detail but I, I I think you can roughly categorize them in in um, some buckets right so which which could be considered um, success factors for that particular phase so the first is um, you really need CEO and senior leadership engagement. So this is, a, I call it a necessary while not sufficient condition. So you need it, you need to have it in place. You need to have the backing from the CEO. Uh, otherwise, the venture at some point um, with with a certain resource demand, with a certain potential for disrupting the organization has a really hard time to grow further in a corporate setting and you don't have the support. And the CEO really has to make sure um, together with the business leaders and the, the, the exploratory leaders that the, the, the venture, um, or the ventures, the portfolio really gets the environment and the support that they need to thrive in the corporate setting. So, so leadership engagement is one thing. I think the second is, um, aut autonomy and uh, a dedicated environment to really pursue uh, those ventures, because as we as we have discussed earlier, um, those new ventures are ba rest basically on a on a completely different management system, right? So the the elements are let's say uh, opposing to some extent to to what what is is done in the core business. So they, and just so I'm clear, when you're talking about having uh, a dedicated space for new ventures, there's obviously different degrees of innovation. If you believe in uh, the the ambition matrix where some are very transformational and different to the core business. Some are very incremental to the core business. So do you think some innovation, core innovation and incremental innovation, whatever you might call it, should that still be in the core business or should that also be in this uh, separate entity? For me, for me, there is a simple rule. Um, so I, I'm, I'm usually, I'm taking the, the corporate perspective. And if a, a, an innovation, a venture, fits at the let's say um at at the at the starting point into the into the core business and supports the the current scope or the current strategy then it has a good chance to survive and thrive in the in the existing core business there's no need to take it outside but if this is not the case and you need to let's say establish some criteria for that then you need to let's say sort them into a different bucket, right? And those other ventures that need a, let's say, a certain uh, extent of, of autonomy, a dedicated building, as I have described before, a venture builder or whatever. So, but this really refers to ventures that do not fit uh, at that point uh, the, the, the current strategy of the core business or the organizational structure of the core business or whatever. So, you have to check this up front. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, let's say, get the integration done uh, later on because it has not been, been prepared. There is no alternative home, right? So you haven't thought about that. 
Absolutely. So we've talked about the principle of requiring leadership support. We've talked about the principle of uh, needing a dedicated space for this innovation. What else is there? I think another important point is, is, is validation and scaling up readiness. There, there are a lot of um, ventures I, I have seen that um, enter the, let's say, a, a, a scaling phase and they're actually not prepared for it. So there are some, some, criti some critical points have not been validated before. And so it's a kind of premature scaling. And I, I, I really urge companies to um, make a com comprehensive validation. We, we suggest along four different uh, dimensions, you know, probably know three of them, like desirability, viability, feasibility. But we also found another one, the fourth one, which we call contextuality. So which is really um, a dimension that checks on, on how a venture is supposed to be embedded in the core business. Is this pathway clear? Has, uh, is, is the funding secured? Um, have we, do we have a future home for that venture? Um, so will it get the re required support to, to develop further, et cetera, et cetera. So th this is a really a dedicated bucket for that. So you have to validate along basically four distinct um, dimensions, right? Okay. And uh, any other principles? Yeah, I think another, <laughs> sorry, another one is, of course, we need to make sure that, that the, the venture can tap the, we call it incumbents advantage, right? So the, the, the existing capabilities of the core business. And um, in doing so um, with minimal encumbrances so not um, it, it, it really should have the the freedom to choose which um, let's say capabilities to tap and this again requires some some um, some some um, extent of autonomy again and and also um, decision making autonomy so the really the venture decides so there there is a certain capability one we want to tap so it benefits us and others uh, don't benefit us, but uh, and we have to make sure that this particular um, capability um, can can be made available for us. And uh, I think this is another uh, important point because that's basically what um, differentiates corporate startups from the greenfield ones and, and gives them a, let's say kind of unfair advantage. But you have to unlock it, and it also comes with managing a lot of tensions. And uh, you won't get the one without the other. So that, that's uh, also something uh, companies often forget. Speaking about managing tensions, uh, we're coming up on time, but I, I can't uh, leave you without asking one last question, uh, which is when it comes to these ventures, and as you said, sometimes the corporate venture building teams have the advantage of the backing of the large company. Um, you mentioned one thing that these ventures need to display is validation and uh, compatibility, contextuality. What's your view on how many chances a venture should be given? Uh, how many times it should be reviewed before either uh, you take away the resources and you effectively kill the project for now, or you just let it keep developing forever and ever? I know that's a great question. I mean, I think you have to distinguish between a, let's call it learning loop, Right, so uh, means you, you basically have the right strategy, the right ambition, the right vision for the venture, but um, you, you still have to to, um, to validate some of the hypotheses, uh, and and uh, so um, you have to take some some extra loops to do that. But the basic strategy is still right, so there is basically no need. Um, to let's say get rid of the venture, and, and you also have to make sure, and that's an important point, that the ventures um, really have a let's call it learning buffer in the budget that they can do these these loops because not everything will be clear right from the beginning, right? But when you see there is no, for example, there, there's no clear strategic fit or there's um, a venture was 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 started without any alignment with the with the core business, for example, and uh, it doesn't make sense to let's say um, to, to to progress it, it further. Uh, then uh, you have to think about what 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 to, what to do with it. It's spinning out, or or even uh, let's say um, 
discontinue. Yeah, but I think it, it it really depends on the on the case. There is not no one size fits all. But as long as it it, it belongs to learning. I th- yeah, I, I agree. It's uh, it's always contextual. Uh, but I, I think the the issue behind it is some teams don't seem to uh, have the skills or the experience to be willing to let some ideas go. <laughs> and I've seen examples where ideas just keep going and going and going and going, even though everyone in the team already knows that there's not this fit and there's uh, not the alignment with the business. But they're they're scared of looking like a failure if uh, if their idea didn't work that somehow they are going to get punished or fired and it's going to look bad at their performance review there's a lot of emotions tied up uh with with venture building and new business building and companies trying something new yeah many many fall in love with their ideas right it, it's a one <laughs> one root cause and uh yeah Absolutely. Ralph, it's been absolutely wonderful speaking with you again. Uh, if people want to find out more about your work or get in touch with you, what's the best place they can find out more? I think uh, the, the best would be to connect on LinkedIn, so I'm quite active there. Um, uh, you can find it under, under my name. I, I frequently post stuff on dual innovation and, and scaling up and just drop me a note and then, uh, uh, yeah, let's have an initial discussion and uh, I'm looking forward to that. Perfect. I'll make sure to get that link down in the description below. Ralph, it's been wonderful speaking with you and I look forward. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share and subscribe and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders, and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to new, as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality. See you again soon.